we'll call our meeting to order. In accordance with the open meeting law, the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Was kind of hidden there. First item on our agenda is the Veterans Day Proclamation. This is Matt Appellan. Do you want me to read it or would you want to read it? Sure. Veterans Day 2016 Proclamation. Whereas on Veterans Day, America becomes one in honoring our veterans. To to commemorate their legacy of honor, pride, courage, and sacrifice. America is strong because of their profound love of this great nation. We as a nation must support our veterans, for we would not be in America if not for their sacrifices. And whereas on this day we recognize the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War. Quote from First Sergeant John Bernard, USMC retired, for those of you who fought in the jungles and rice paddies of Vietnam, your return home was not to the sound of brass pans and the sight of unfurled flags. You deserved far more for the indignities you were asked to endure, the loss of brothers you still mourn, the wounds you suffered physically and mentally. There is one thing that remains certain. No man or woman who has ever sworn the oath of enlistment should ever feel the least bit of shame. We now stand before you and say thank you for the courage, sacrifice, and commitment to the oath you displayed. We stand before you amongst many witnesses and say welcome home. And whereas on this day in support of our veterans struggling to reacquaint with the civilian world, we must remain vigilant within our communities to assist our veterans in their time of need. Many come home with physical and mental impairments. Suicide rate is at 22 per day. Many are jobless, homeless. No veteran should be homeless. Their valorous acts are indicative of the support they deserve. And whereas on this day, we give recognition to our Blue Star families for the sacrifices they make each day. Our Blue Star families continue to struggle day to day with their loved one away from home while striving to maintain normalcy within the family unit. They must remain supportive and strong upon their warriors' return to help them overcome the mental and physical disabilities plagued by war. And whereas, on this day, we remain forever grateful to our Gold Star families who have made the ultimate sacrifice. Their lives have changed forever as they carry the legacy of their loved one through their memories. Continue to keep them in your prayers. And whereas we must continue to educate our young through involvement in action, the importance of honor, respect, and appreciation for the valor and sacrifice of our veterans and warriors. Now, therefore, let it be proclaimed by the Board of Selectmen of the Town of North Reading that all citizens observe the 11th day of November 2016 with appropriate ceremony and prayer in honor of our, our veterans and warriors whose steadfast desire was and is through valor and sacrifice to preserve the principles of justice, freedom, and democracy. We encourage you to continue to display the American flag with pride on your homes, offices, and town buildings. Thank Mr. You. Chairman, we I move to sign the Veterans Day Proclamation. Second. Second, Second Mr. Prisco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous? Well, we're passing that around. Uh, the Veterans Day uh, ceremony is this Friday at 11 o'clock. And uh, is there anyone that wants to read the proclamation? Or I will do it. Well, am I down to speak? I have you as a, one of the speakers. Yes. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should leave the proclamation for someone. I'm sorry? Uh, since I'm going to be a speaker, uh, we could leave the proclamation to one of the other board members. Okay. 
I have I no problem. Do it. I'm going to be there. I have no problem doing yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I can still I, do I, it. I don't mind. Give someone else an opportunity. No, no, no. Okay. That resolves <clears throat> that issue. Uh, if, if, if I, if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, to the audience who are here and to people who are listening, uh, Friday. 11 o'clock is Veterans, the celebration of uh, Veterans Day. Uh, bring your children, bring your family, come by yourself, but be there, okay? Uh, this will be on the common. Uh, the weather would be, if the weather's nice, it will be outside, and if it's not so nice, it'll be in the batch, is that correct? Correct. correct. All right, so, so if, if by chance it's, the weather doesn't uh, isn't cooperative. We're not canceling it. Come, because the veterans would uh, will really appreciate your attendance, because it's a very heartwarming experience for everybody to attend, and it has a great impact on on children too. So bring the children. That's very important. So thank and, you. And thank you, Susan. May I add you, something uh, to that? Into, uh, <coughs> thank you. May I add something to that? To, to the uh, people out in the community. Being the 50th, um, the com uh, commemoration of the 50th anniversary to the Vietnam War, it would be really appreciative if people would definitely take the time. Um, if you have a neighbor or, some, or a veteran that's unable to get there and you can give them a drive or find them a ride, that would be great. But more importantly, let's get that, the common filled up and let's give those Vietnam veterans the overdue welcome that they deserve. Thank you. Okay, the next item is we're going to discuss the residential tax rate exemption, and Deborah Carboni is here. Uh, just a little background in this. Uh, last year, after we had done the, uh, while we were in the process of setting the tax rate, uh, we kind of skipped over this exemption, and we continue to talk about what our elders or people that have lived in town for a long time, living on fixed income, deal with specifically, uh, and that a lot of these smaller homes, their assessed valuations are going up at a faster rate. And there is an opportunity called a residential exemption to make an adjustment. Uh, I met with uh, Deborah and the town administrator and uh, our town finance director and what I didn't appreciate that it's a little more complicated than risk meets the eye so I thought it would be good for the board to kind of get a, an overview of this and then I'm not even necessarily proposing although the board can decide to to consider it for this coming tax rate because I think we would need to have some public hearing or hearings as an education to the public to get some more input than we would normally when we have a tax classification <coughs> hearing. Anyway, I'll leave that up to the board. But uh, Deborah's put together a presentation and uh, she's here prepared to answer any questions that uh, any of the board members might have. How do you want to start this, Michael? I, I think we can turn it over to the assessor. Okay. She's got a presentation That's that she right. put the together. The podium is now over there, by the I way. I know. <laughs> and for those that haven't been uh, to town hall in the past, since our last meeting here, I guess, uh, you can see we've made some changes in technology, and uh, hopefully it's for the benefit of the public, too, because I think people now have a better opportunity of getting the information that we're talking about on the screen for those people watching on cable. Go ahead, Deborah. I'd like to start off by saying good evening to everyone. Uh, our job here tonight is to understand what the residential exemption is, how it functions, and if it would be right for the town of North Reading. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Debbie Carboni, Assessing Manager for the Town of North Reading. I'd like to start off by explaining what the definition is from the Department of Revenue of the residential exemption. 
And also the fact that the residential exemption is also part of the classification hearing that we will be holding in two weeks from tonight, actually. And that is a vote that the board has to take, the Board of Selectmen has to vote um, on the 21st, whether to adopt or not adopt, along with three other um, adopt uh, three other votes that will be taken that night. So to explain exactly what the definition is, the residential exemption can be adopted by the Board of Selectmen up to 20% off the average assessed value of our residential. That does not mean our commercial, our, that does not mean our commercial property, our industrial property, or personal. The principal, the parcels that are principal residents, so in other words, the homes that would be accepted for the residential exemption have to be owner occupied. The intent of the exemption when it was first brought into the Department of Revenue and adopted was to promote home owner occupancy for multifamilies um, in your urban areas. Okay, the shift that occurs reallocates the taxes borne by the residential class. So what happens is you have an assessed valuation of all of your residential properties. That value divided by the number of assessed residential parcels equals your average value, your average number of parcels to be affected. I think I confused that. By doing that, you're coming up with a median. And Mike, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. This slide here will explain what are total properties that do consume our residential properties. We have 4,258 single families. We have 755 condominiums. We have 72 multifamilies, that's your two family units, your three family units, up to five. So the total residential parcels that can be affected from the residential exemption is 5,085. Now, our total, our total assessed valuation that we have in what we call class one, these properties right here, is 2,553,286,900. That gives us a median value of 502,121. We'll see that on the further, on the next slide. So that's going to be our median value. Any house? Yep. Mr. Chairman, through you. <coughs> Debbie, could you just clarify that valuation? Is that for FY17 or is that? That is 17. That, so that's yes. an actual number yes. at this point for the upcoming classification hearing. That is, that is our values for FY17. RLA4 is certified for the reval. Mm -hmm. I do want to clarify one thing Thank though. You. Because this residential value that I just gave you is not our average single family. Let's, if you go back to that other slide of what, what consumes in the residential property, residential classes, it's more than your single families. So I want to be clear on that. Do you say that again, please? The residential property classes for the exemption purposes is made up of these three right. different residential property classes. Right. 
not our average single family. Okay? Just, just to clarify, uh, Jeff, what you're saying is that the, of the different, resi uh, different tax classifications, three of them uh, are eligible and qualify for this particular approach. And that came to the five, uh, 585. The, the 5085 number, okay? Okay, thank you. Because at classification, I'm going to be giving you the, the average single family value. So I just wanted to be clear on that. Okay, so the scenario, if we just follow this down, the middle column of the 502-121 was our average. So if we just keep it simple, we take the column to the left of 352-121, which is under our average, and then the column to the right, I did a million dollar home. <coughs> So a million one hundred and two one twenty one. Our current I used FY sixteen tax rate because that's a certified rate. We do not have FY seventeen. So if you use sixteen forty one or our FY sixteen current tax rate, the third line is the taxes in which those values of those homes would have paid. The line where it says savings and cost, that is going to come from the average single family exempt amount. So the middle column of the 502-121 is not going to receive any kind of discount because that's our average. But the one to the right, as you can see, is going to be reduced by the 273.50. The higher end home of the million dollar 1,102,121 will pay the 1,094 in addition to their original tax. Now, when I started off, I said we're not changing the the amount of taxes for this class doesn't change we're only redistributing the taxes so the under assessed homes from your average will pay less your higher assessed homes will pay more we're redistributing the tax. Any questions? No questions? No, I'll, I'll just say that uh, in the assessed valuation above and below the average, right? And she talks about a savings of 273.50 or 109.4. That's a variable depending on where people stand within the, you know, with, within their uh, tax class of uh, their assessed valuation. Right. right. So it's not the, the range. It's that's the range. So the 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 1094 is the highest taxpayer. Um, Am I correct in that? I, I or is I that did a more of an average? The new, the new norm. Okay. The new norm. The new norm. Continue. So, I'm sorry, Bob. Were continue. You, you can continue. Uh, that's a 10 percent. You got 15 and 20 percent too. Mm -hmm. so. <coughs> I'm sorry, Steve. No, I just said we we've got three scenarios here: 10 percent, 15 percent, and 20 percent shift. Yeah. Um, and I think what's important to to note, and again, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to have this presented because, again, every year when we go through the tax classification hearing, this is the one that tends to be glossed over. Um, and I think what's important is for you to present to us as to which types of communities usually use this uh, this exemption. And we, we generally don't fall into that category because, again, this is just a, a shift among residential properties, 
not a commercial right. industrial uh, right. shift. Correct. Yeah. So to, to um, tag on to what Steve was saying, typically this exemption is adopted in your urban areas, such as Boston, such as uh, Somerville has it, Watertown has it, um, actually I have the list. Brookline has it. And the reason they do that is because their numbers of multifamilies that they have versus what the town of North Reading has is far more than what we even see. They're trying to promote homeowner occupancy so that that's if it if they're not owner occupied, they don't receive the exemption. So the other adoption reason that was taken into consideration when this was implemented was your your vacation areas such as the vineyard, such as the Cape Cod towns. And that was again so that they could increase their revenue, their tax base by charging the second homes more money because they're not owner occupied. So that was really the whole purpose in the division of the Department of Revenue really implementing this exemption. Most of your rural communities, and I know I did check around, there's none that I could find that have adopted this. It, it's just not feasible to do that. I mean, I, you know, if you're going to shift to the commercial and industrial too, that would be different. But at the end of the day, if you shift higher on the residential, there in it's in the next slide, where some of your higher residential properties would actually be paying a higher tax rate than your commercial and industrial. So we would have to be very careful with that. The advantages and disadvantages, and, and I received this information from the town of Brookline. When I talked to Harry Grossman, who actually used to be the chief of the bureau uh, back in the 80s, they, he said that they adopted it some 30 years ago. He said it, it's a lot of work on both the assessing and collector's office. So the advantages, I'm going to start at the beginning, is reducing the tax burden on the lower assessed residential properties including all the residential properties discussed earlier. Your single families, your condos, and your multi-units. The disadvantages. Shifting a higher tax rate to the residential properties that are higher assessed than the median residential value, and that goes back to our 502-121 value, could mean, wait a minute, this could result in commercial and industrial personal and personal property paying a lower tax rate than the higher assessed residential properties. And, and again, we're talking the million dollars properties. We would also have to consider Munis to rewrite our CAMA software bridge to include this exemption because when we did, um, write the bridge to adopt Munis as our tax program, we did not have the exemption at that point. I do not know of the cost. I do not know of the time frame. I do not know that information. I, is it something that we would have to get? Absolutely, we would. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the end of the day, we certainly wouldn't be considering, for us to consider this exemption for FY17, between rewriting CAMA and the fact that we did not obtain the applications for the potential 5,085 parcels, I don't know how 
we would implement that for FY17. So as during our meeting with Bob Bettier and, and Liz and myself, you know, in discussing this, there's really a lot of work that has to be done <coughs> before the two offices can really implement it. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Yes. Uh, on uh, going back to the advantages just for a second, uh, reducing a tax burden on lower assessed residential properties. If the property is assessed at a low value, aren't they already receiving uh, reduced tax, reduced taxes? Well, the, the rate's the same, I assume, but, but, but because the value is assessed low, they're not, they're getting, they're getting, I don't know what the right word to use, but they're, they're not paying as much as they would be if, it, if their property was assessed high. The taxes are always based on the assessed value times the rate. Right. So if there's a house that's valued at 250000 times the rate, that's the taxes they're right. paying. But you need to remember that we, for this exemption, for the purpose of this exemption, you have a median house value of 502-121. So anything under that 502-121 would receive either 10, 15, or 20 percent reduced From the on their the taxes. From their assessed value? Not, not value, tax. The tax. We're That's only shifting the tax. We're not changing value. You're shifting the tax. That's it. You end up, Jeff, with different tax rate across the spectrum between the low end and where the average is and the high end. And I had asked for an explanation of this because one of the issues that we face and we hear it every year, is that we have the smaller homes in North Reading mm -hmm. have appreciated at a higher percentage rate than mm -hmm. the larger okay. homes okay. as a result of the fact that what's going on in the industry is people are buying them up and you know, they end up with more value and then they're building either you know, making them two-story or tearing them down or whatever and reselling them. So we have taxpayers that have lived in town for quite a long time that are on fixed incomes that are getting hit with this. And right. I wanted to see if this in fact was, because we've glossed it over every year, as an approach. What I learned in, in the meeting was that it's far more complicated than it appears up front. One of the things that she hasn't mentioned, is that in there? Regarding, they have to file for this exemption. Um, that's on the next. All right, okay. I, don't, right I, I don't want to steal your thunder. Okay. There, I'll Thank let you take you. the next step. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> so, under continuing on the disadvantages is the fact that any of the potential 5,085 parcels that could qualify there is an application that has to be turned in to the assessing office. The assessor's office will determine eligibility. Now, on, you ask, what are those eligibility terms? Well, I did print off the application from Brookline, and believe it or not, even if the property is in a trust, that could disqualify. But again, we would have to get trust documents. We have to make sure that the applicant is a trustee, has beneficial and financial interest for them to continue to qualify. This application has to be sent into our office every year um, on July 1st. So, oh, n I'm sorry, I just made a mistake on that. They. The initial application process <coughs> is turned into our office, and then the assessor's office, out of the 5,085 parcels that are qualifying, we have to monitor that. 
we would have to go on the registry of deeds, we would have to see if it went into a trust, then we have to find out if they have beneficial and financial interest, if they've sold the property. So that application process really is very vague when it comes down to the workload of what, how it operates. You know, it should be such as all the other exemptions, like our elderly exemptions, our veterans exemptions, where they have to turn in an application every year to qualify. But this residential exemption does not work like that. So say we qualify 2,000 out of the 5,085. 2,000 of those 2,000 parcels will have to be reviewed by somebody in our office to see if they still qualify for the following fiscal year. Steve, just a quick question. So in order to qualify, so this is the, we're talking about qualifications for the exemption and the tax benefit. Yes. Not, conversely, does it work the other way for the property owners who may have placed their home in a trust and it's a million dollar home? Are they exempted from this? It, or do they get whacked with the additional tax? They would still receive, they would still receive the increase. They still receive the increase, so there isn't any. There's the, the, the qualifications for being put into the pool for consideration are not the same. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Correct. It would it would go on the other end. It goes one way. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, the other <clears throat> to continue on the disadvantage. Are there any other questions on the qualifications of the application portion of it? <clears throat> Okay, to continue. No, Catherine has a question. I just had a general question, not necessarily about the application, um, but um, just in terms of the 5,085 properties, do you have a sense of, are most of those <coughs> owner-occupied? Munis keeps a record of whether they're owner-occupied or not. It keeps the name of the homeowner. So do you know, um, I, do, do you have a sense of that at this I point? I don't know of Munis monitoring home occupancy? No, I don't mean monitoring, but you would know the property owner, the record owner, and well, you, you would know when it changes hands, in other words. So that, right. right. I can tell you there, actually, I want to back up a little bit. Do I have a sense of approximately how many out of the 5,085? Potentially. I, I would say maybe half maybe would qualify because so, I have to factor in trust. A lot of people do estate planning. When they're doing estate planning, they don't necessarily maintain, they have a life estate to it. If they have a life estate, then they have full financial and beneficial interest. Mm -hmm. If they have not maintained the life estate, then and they only have, say, the, the beneficial interest as being a trustee, then they're disqualified. I would, it's a, it's a difficult number to give you because there is no record, either my assessing records, we've never had to maintain that, and in the tax records, we don't either. You can own a piece of property, but not live there. So we could definitely run a report and filter out some of them just by owner address. Absolutely. Do I know how many? I would only guess that the, the safest number to give you, and it's, and it's a guess, is say how. So basically, to take in that median that you gave, probably the 502, 121, yep. Yeah. Half of those would probably fit within the exemption requirements. The other half, which is on the higher, you know, higher under that median, would be absorbing the what is exempted. So that the the amount that's exempted comes falls under the bottom half, right, or the top half. 
And, and the other you know, half, basically. It's just from inspecting the properties personally for the, for the many that I do. Uh, I do know some of the condos, it's not their primary residence. They have their primary residence in, in Florida. Uh, some of them, I just actually inspected one last week. Their primary residence is in Lee. So they're exempt already. They're, they don't qualify. But, you know, the safest number that I would feel comfortable in saying that it is exactly that as an estimate is to is half. Okay, Deborah, do you want to uh, finish up so that uh, we've got a number of other items on our agenda and uh, so continuing on the disadvantages would be space for the application, storage of um, the collected applications. They would have to maintain the abatement retention regulations, which is three years. So after three years, we could get rid of them. Uh, Brookline, I put this in here. He said they need to hire additional personnel to maintain and execute the exemption workload. Um, after speaking to him, it, it, it is cumbersome. It is. Mike, can we go to the next slide, please? So in conclusion, the residential exemption was designed to offset second home communities, like I mentioned, the Cape. Uh, you know, they're, they're not their primary residence. The other uh, reason that it was designed for was for urban communities adopted the residential exemption to encourage multifamily properties owners to occupy the property. Thus, the reason most rural areas do not have the residential exemption. And again, as I mentioned earlier, I've not found any immediate abutting communities that have adopted the residential exemption. Are there any other questions? Any other questions? We, we will not be necessarily <laughs> making any decisions. We're point. clearly not making any decisions tonight on this. And it would be done in a tax classification hearing if we decide to go what I thought it would be valuable to the board to have some information associated with, with okay. this. Michael. Why would you think something like this would even be considered when it's designed for a community that doesn't even fit North Reading? It makes absolutely no well, sense that we'd one, even spend one, 10 minutes. It was on. not clear to me that that was the case. Okay, and I'm still not 100% convinced that that's not the case. It is a way of transferring the tax burden or shifting it slightly so that people that are in fixed and low income homes right, can get a little bit of a break. But you know, that burden then gets shifted to the higher end value uh, assessed property. So you rather shift it on the residents but exclude the commercial base completely. Well, no, I, I, I think this is just one thing that we're going to pass absurd. over yeah. every year. This no, is absurd. No, no, I, I think I think we're missing the point here. Now. I'm not missing the point. But, uh, now I appreciate the the presentation tonight because this is one uh, opportunity that the board has every year to consider that we don't spend a lot of time on, and, and again, for good reason, because it really doesn't fit the community well. But, right. but the first for, bullet but, says but, it all. But for the, for the public's consumption, right. to understand that you know, some of the considerations that we have every year, this is a consideration. And will we have a significant number of homes now being bought up, torn down, you know, and uh, again, people are looking to age in place, and you know, it may be a, an improper assumption, but generally lower assessed homes, you know, mean that uh, people with lower income or people who have been in town and are aging in the community are, are living in uh, so we, every member of the board is concerned with trying to allow people to stay in their home and age in place, uh, and this is one consideration that we have as an option, and I appreciate the opportunity that was taken tonight to just present it to us with a little bit more time than we normally spend on the cl classification hearing. Uh, over the years, we haven't opted to exercise our opportunities yet, and I don't anticipate we would either, but again, it's uh, something is... The demographics change here, and if we're still looking for economic development, we're looking to shift from that's tax classification from a commercial industrial 
for residential. Um, this is one just within the residential structure that we have, an option or an opportunity that we have. Uh, so I appreciate the, uh, the presentation, uh, the information. Uh, this is the most time we've spent on it in years. And uh, we can make a better informed decision in a couple of weeks as to whether or not we want to consider it or not. So I appreciate I, that. I would go one step further, Steve, is if, if we, as a board, right, decided we wanted to go down this path, I, I wouldn't recommend doing it at this next tax rate classification. Right. I would consider it in a previous, uh, you know, in the following year with several public hearings associated with the impact this would have on mm -hmm. the entire uh, community. But I thought it would be valuable for the board to understand that this is something that we skip over every year, and it's an op I, 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 uh, an opportunity to look at other options. I think we, you know, we do spend time on the commercial exemption. I think we have a reasonable understanding of what this is. This ends up being more complicated than <laughs> it appears to. Right? You think just so, yeah, you make a calculation, it's all done. Yeah, and the important it part is the yeah, law doesn't it, it, read it's that. It's a lot way, more so. work if we don't collect 10 cents more. Yeah. You know, it just, and I think when, when Deborah mentions the fact that it was designed for places like down the cave for people that uh, multiple family homes, it was based on the fact that other people that were in that classification of small properties, right? We're getting hammered because these other small properties may have been valued there, but they're people are making money off of it. And That's absolutely different. correct. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, could I just add one thing? I just want to remind the elderly taxpayers out there, and I, I shouldn't categorize it such as that. But in our office right now, as of July 1st, 2016, opens the exemption application process. You have until April 1st. That, that just changed from the um, modernization bill. It used to be uh, three months from the date of the mailing. So you have until April 1st to come in, call our office, we have little sheets that are written up for the different exemptions because there are various exemptions that you may or may not qualify for. Some of them are income asset. Some of them are also just due to other reasons. The veterans, there are different levels of veterans applications in which you may qualify for. Uh, you do have to have at least 10% disability to apply for that one. In addition to that is our senior work-off program. Our senior work-off program is, is one of the most valuable programs, I, I think. I know I, I utilize it all year round. Uh, but that's 100 hours within a 12-month period for $500 off your February bill and your May bill. That's $250, $250. So that's, you know, that's a very valuable thing if, if they're willing to do it. And there are many areas in which the senior work off, you know, can participate. So it's, you know, just about yes, all sir. offices do do that. Yes, so I did want to at least, Sorry, you know, you. put that in there that there are other options that are available. And like I said, just call our office. We'll we'll answer your question. Thank you, Deborah. Just go yes, Michael. I'm a fan of trying to find any solution to reduce the burden on our seniors. Mm -hmm. This just doesn't work for me. But in Reading, they just implemented that means base. I think it was uh, senior property tax exemption. Are you I, familiar with it? Well, I actually have been in touch with Victor who is the assessor in Reading and Wakefield. And um, I was just at a meeting with him. He Representative Jones, I believe, had a hearing where they put a home room petition in to have a means-based senior property tax exemption for Reading. What's and it called, Mike? Means-based. Means-based. Means. I'd like to learn a little bit more about it. If it's valuable for a local or a neighboring community, maybe it would be value for us seniors. 
think our time may be better spent on that exemption than on this particular exemption. So I'll be honest, I've never heard of it. Huh? Will I look into it? Absolutely. I will talk I would to appreciate it. and find out what exactly is. I, I had it on my uh, old and new business things I was going to bring up tonight, but I figured this is a, probably a better opportunity to do that. I will check into it. Okay. Any other questions? I think we're all set. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, meet with the food pantry. Members of the food pantry here? Come on up to the podium. Podium? Introduce yourselves. Mr. Masiri, if I could in just yeah. start the... Um, sure. I, I actually forced him, to, forced him to come in yeah. tonight. You no, know, I asked him to come in because this is the time of year. We've had him in every year, and uh, when Sandy was here, I'd asked her, but uh, we do miss her, but we're happy you guys are here. I think this is a great time of the year as we start to approach the holidays to have the food pantry come in quick update on what's been going on and the needs that they have and the needs of the, the users and, and anything that the community could potentially do to help. I think this is a great opportunity for you to give us a little update on that would be much appreciated. Okay, well, I'm Ellen Wachlansky. I'm not Sandy Carica, and but I am the, <laughs> right. the chair of the, of the CCS and the pantry. Now we're an all volunteer organization. Uh, we do spend $126 for post office box and $36 a month for a phone. The, that's our overhead for the year. So all of our um, money is comes in and is used for direct um, client services for food and um, utilities and bills that they have trouble paying themselves. Penny Esposito has been on the board as long as I have. But I don't, I, I don't count how many years that is. It's been a lot, though. Um, but we're active, and we have about 100 clients on, in a given month who use the pantry on a regular basis, 120. Our list is longer than that because a lot of people only come in when, um, when the wolf is knocking at the door. Um, but we do have a lot of people who use the pantry often. And we have a, and we have about um, 60 kids, I think, this year, uh, who will be getting the take a tag gifts, the tags that are in the post office, and are distributed to um, the various churches. And they, uh, that's that's us. <laughs> we do that. We're not just the food pantry. Although the food pantry is our most visible thing, we are very active with. Uh, anyone who has um, financial needs, people who need rides for doctor's appointments, even um, lots of levels, we help out. We do have the Greater Boston Food Bank where we get a lot of our, um, well, anything that needs to be in the refrigerator or freezer comes from the Greater Boston Food Bank where we get things that are, uh, <coughs> excuse me, much reduced cost. We get food from donations from people in town and everything else we have to buy at the retail level. We go to stop and shop and market basket and, and just buy things <laughs> like anyone does who goes to the supermarket. We don't get any, any discount from them. Um, we're about, uh, things don't change too much. What we do need, and I'm sure everyone in this room would agree with, but they also need more space. So it would be lovely if we had some storage space. Um, just, it's crowded. You're welcome. We're open every Monday from 9 to 10 a.m. And on the first and third Monday evenings, come down and see, see how, how it looks down there. We're, we're down the hall it, on the, used to be the stage. It's crowded. It's hot. It's dirty. <laughs> <laughs> But it's and we but we could use we did um, the Rotary Club gave us um, refrigerator and freezer I don't know five years ago something like that so we stole some space from the garden club for that for that to be there and at the other end of the the gym is storage space that I'm not sure who uses that but um, every now and then one of those doors open and it would be lovely if we could have one of those. Could you elaborate a little bit on the kind of space you need? Is this for storage of food or, or basic 
the fact that you have a lot of people coming in and out and then storage um, well we do have we also have a storage unit that we pay for, we do pay for that too but it's for food mostly yeah looking, not for clients no yeah not for it's for, for uh, food when suddenly we get a, a good deal on um, so baked beans <laughs> we might have more cases of that than we could use in a short period of time but it would be great to have it on hand for when we need it so it would be food uh, you know um, non-perishable food um, it would be in like an auxiliary storage space mm -hmm. or something like that Any other questions on the board? Yeah. Michael. So are there any particular items you need donated as you go through the holidays? Are there specific, specific foods, canned goods, perishables, non-perishables? Well, we can always use, nothing ever goes to waste, ever. If, even if it's something that, that our clients don't use often, um, black beans, for instance. The clients in North Reading don't eat a lot of those. They're very healthy, but they kind of um, multiply in the cupboards. Uh, we send those, so we take them to Lawrence to a food pantry there. Uh, we do need any, we can always use um, taxable items because people who are on food stamps are, um, they can't use food stamps for non perishable items. So, um, you know, laundry detergent, toothpaste, paper towels. That diapers, um, things like that, we are, are we use a lot. Um, and the other thing that some a lot of people don't realize is that people are hungry all year long, and it's not just at Christmas time that they need food. Um, this is when we get a lot of um, food donations, and we have a lot of people who want to volunteer right now, uh, and they um, all of that kind of disappears by March. So uh, it is, we're here all the time, and we try to be visible, but um, we don't want to be obnoxious either. So <laughs> it's a fine line there sometimes. So I, I gather that, I, I know there's been some changes because uh, a couple of people that were in the leadership positions have moved on or moved out of town. Uh, do you have adequate <coughs> volunteers? I mean, can we make a pitch for that too? Or? <laughs> we can always say we have. I would say we we did lose a couple of um, well, Sandy Carricker and Kathy Jervy, who were both um, have both moved and were very active. But I don't think they and it kind of it impacted us a little bit as to who's doing what. But I don't think there was any impact at all on our clients and the services they received. I don't think there was any blip on the screen at all that. We do need drivers. We go to the Greater Boston Food Bank every Friday, and we need volunteers with a truck <laughs> to do that. Um, we have people who do that um, often, often. We have to use the same people over and over again, and it would be nice if we could add someone else to that mix. Um, but volunteers are volunteers, so uh, often we have, we're tripping over each other because everyone shows up at the same day and the next week uh, everyone's gone to Florida and, um, mm -hmm. and we're struggling because mm -hmm. that's the, the pluses and the minuses of being a volunteer. Could you explain, and my wife helps out on Fridays, mm -hmm, Fridays. and she mentioned something about the fact that someone goes into Boston with a truck. Is this? Uh, a personal truck that someone's using, or yes, do you yes. have a truck? Or no, we do not. It's somebody do you don't? Truck. We do not have a truck. No, you don't. Okay. Volunteers. So if you didn't have a volunteer with the truck, the truck, then you'd have a big problem. Then we wouldn't get our orders from Boston. Okay. Like that. So that's an issue that uh, yes. potentially. Uh, I don't know whether it's an issue today, but it could be an issue yeah. tomorrow. Just as what's happened mm -hmm. with some of the people that were in the leadership position that moved away. So. Exactly. Somehow, some way, it usually works out somehow. Any other comments, Michael? Yeah. Jeffrey? Yeah, first of all, thank you for what you do. I mean, that's uh, uh, immeasurable. Um, when, you talk, when you say truck, do you mean like a van? Is that what you mean? Pickup truck. Yeah, pickup truck. They have to, yeah, whatever right. you can get it in there. They get about 2,000 pounds of food on a, a weekly basis at the Greater Boston Food Bank. So, you know, <coughs> pounds of, of 
Oh, frozen vegetables. Oh, yeah, a frozen chicken doesn't take up as much space as 2,000 pounds of toilet paper. Right. So it's, it, um, but so sometimes it's two trucks that go in, sometimes it's just one, but it's, it's about 2,000 pounds is our limit of having two vehicles go in. And they just, know, you know, um, they're not, they just pick up trucks that right. people own. Did you just a quick, uh, I've found you on Facebook. Can you just, where can we find you online? Your website, Facebook, what are those, so people can come and look up. I think sometimes you post what you need, what you need is and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> do, we, do we have a link to you from our town? Right. Oh, I don't know if there is a link to um, our, we're, um, I know you're on Facebook. Is that it's yeah, right? we're on Facebook. We do have uh, uh, North Reading Food Pantry org is our web page. It's not updated on a regular basis. We use Facebook more um, when we need. We will post that what we need or yeah, that kind right. of thing. We use email to get in touch with our clients. Um, so the Facebook page is more for for donors and the. Um, although for, if we're going to be closed or if it's a snow day or whatever, we we'll get post that on Facebook more than on the, the website. No. So, so I think, you know, uh, uh, speaking for the entire board, uh, one is, uh, you know, I think we really want to thank you and all of the volunteers of the Food Pantry for all the work you do for those members of our community they were in need for one time or another and uh, you know if there's uh, you know coming here tonight is good because we get some more word out but you know if you have a need at any point in time uh, I would suggest you get in touch with the town administrator and see if there's something that we can do to help out thank you thank you any other questions Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Okay, we thank have you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Mike, for bringing him in. We have a public hearing. Uh, we're running a little late, but uh, maybe we'll make up the time. Ridgedale Convenience Store transfer of package storm wine and malt beverages to Desky and change of location. So this uh, representatives. Uh, here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we'll yes, read the hearing notice. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Do you have it? Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in accordance with Chapter 138 of the Massachusetts General Laws, a public hearing will be held by the Board of Selectmen from 14 Town Hall, 235 North Street, on Monday, November 7, 2016, at 845 on the application of this is going to be a good one for me. Back Tenadin LLC DBA. I apologize if I mispronounced it. Richdale Convenience Store for the transfer of the package store wine and mall alcohol beverage license and change of location. License to be exercised at 4 Lowell Road, Unit 1, North Reading, Massachusetts, occupying 1,150 total square feet. We'll sign by the board of selectmen. Mr. Gilbert, do you have anything to say before we leave? Uh, I think at this point, perhaps okay. to defer to the petitioner. Okay, my name is Gregory DeMarcus. I'm an attorney in Lynn, and we're going to make you an honorary Indian. You did not butcher that name. Mm -hmm. uh, the applicant is Bactinadin LLC. It operates the Richdale store on Full Wall Road, uh, right off of Route 28 in uh, North Reading. Uh, tonight, Vivek Patel, who's the owner of the LLC, is here. He's 100% owner of the LLC. And to his left is Shola Patel. She would be the manager. Uh, Mr. Patel has entered into a purchase and sale agreement with Pendleton Ventures, Inc. to purchase the beer and wine license at the current Tedeschi's location. As you know, uh, the Tedeschi's got bought out and Mr. Pendleton entered into a purchase and sale agreement. And a couple of months ago, um, uh, 
the transfer of the license at that location was denied because uh, because the use was limited by the by the seller of the um, real estate was putting restrictions on the deed which would limit the use of the store as a full convenience store would have had limited uh, sales to lottery cigarettes stuff like that. So in any event, uh, the applicant in that hearing, Rebecca Patel, owns the Richdale store, uh, which I think you're all familiar with, on Four Lowell Road. He's owned it for three years. It's a very well-run store. It's in a very nice plaza, very well-run store, very neat, well-kept. Um, he's done a great job. Uh, it, it's in a commercial area. Um, now. Mr. Patel has an interest in two other liquor stores, one in Kingston called R.A. Liquors and one in Pembroke called V.B. Liquors. And he's, had, he's owned those stores for approximately 12 years each. And there's not been one violation or one incident um, in those two stores. Um, the, uh, Mr. Patel told me that uh, he has already purchased, hopefully, the, uh, in anticipation of an approval, a state-of-the-art scanner for about $4,500. He's going to scan in every single, uh, the, 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 uh, the identification, the license of every single person who appears to be under the age of 40 years old. Uh, and that's the store policy. And that's the policy that's had him, had so much success at his other two stores. Shola Patel is a resident of North Reading and has lived here for 13 uh, years and she's right uh, spitting distance from the store on Greenbrier. She's going to work at the store and she's she's tip certified. She got tip certified. It was a very going to be a very well run o uh, operation. I want to say Mr. Patel uh, on his own uh, sent in green cards and uh, certified mail for 108 uh, butters. Um, he's a very competent, qualified individual. I just want to speak a little about the, the, the location. You know where the, you know where Lowell Road is, it's off of Route 28. Uh, there is a store, uh, New England Beverage and Redemption, uh, about a tenth of a mile with, with an all alcoholic beverage license. Um, the closest uh, store with a uh, beer and wine license only is the Speedway gas station about six tenths of a mile away. Uh, but that's in the gas station. The closest store that's, uh, that is a convenience store with a beer and wine license is uh, the Convenience Plus on 7 Main Street, which is about 1.1 mile away. Uh, the next nearest one is Molly's uh, store, DBA Rye store on 162 Park Street, which is almost two miles away. And then Christopher's Market is 2.3 miles away. So it's in a commercial area. It's, it's not uh, in a cluster of other licenses. You're, you're getting a first class operator that manages a resident of North Reading, been here for 13 years. Um, I think it's a terrific combination. Uh, and you, you, this isn't a guy uh, who's, who. You can't check it what, he, what he's done. You can see what he's done with his other two stores in Kingston and Pembroke and what he's done with his store here in North Reading. So we would urge that the uh, application for a license and transfer of location to Fall Lowell Road be approved as long as, in addition to the appointment of Shola Patel as the manager. Are there any uh, residents present that uh Butters to uh, the location. Would like to speak. Yeah. Would like to speak, of course. Good evening. I'm neither a resident nor a butter, but I uh, represent Stelios Papadopoulos, uh, sitting right here, who owns, uh, recently purchased uh, the property where the liquor license formerly was at Tedeschi's. He's been a businessman here in North Reading since 1989, running Captain Pizza, Pizza USA, I think. Um, and he's been a re he rented that business location from Tedeschi's. And um, 
it's that license uh, from Tedeschi's and the transfer location that he really objects to. Uh, he bought this property expecting to lease out this property to someone who could keep that license at that location. Um, in fact, as uh, Attorney Demarcus just pointed out, uh, Vivek Patel was here just in August and was denied the license. Um, and procedurally, I, I, you know, I'm not so sure that uh, once you've been denied a license, you can apply for another one within 12 months. But more than that, um, I urge you to look at uh, the, lo the transfer of the location. Um, the new location, as Attorney Demarcus just pointed out, is um, at the corner of uh, Lowell Road and 28. And um, if I counted right, I think there's 10 businesses right there in that little plaza. And um, again, if I counted right, there's 32 parking spots right there. And I think the addition of the liquor license there could create some traffic problems for the city. In addition to the fact that, as was pointed out, there's a, a full service liquor store just across the street. You get the Walgreens and behind that the New England beverage. Um, so for those reasons, we urge you to deny this and uh, hopefully that uh, the, the license can be kept at the same location. I know there's other people that want to talk about it. Thank you, Mr. Good evening. My name is Therios Papadopoulos. I'm the trustee of Olympia 3, Rio de Trust. I just purchased the building October 3rd. And uh, I've been there for 29 years, since 1989. And I had a very good relationship with the Deskis. And uh, I thought I'm going to keep the license over there. Because first of all, we have more parking than the new location they tried to transfer the license. They have only one exit. We have two exits. And all the customers, I have a, have a uh, folder there, over 300 people signed to support to keep the license in our area for the service of our customers and cooperation for the new store and my business too. Uh, we have been very successful there and everybody likes us. Captain Pizza is a famous uh, pizza in town and I want to keep the new tenant uh, with a new license to our place, not transfer the license. That's why I'm here. I want to um, please reconsider the decision to keep the license in our place uh, to, to North Street. Thank you. <coughs> As you guys Name know and from last meeting, huh? Name and address. Oh, Chris Pendleton, uh, Three Revere Road, Tuxbury, Mass. Um, I'm the current owner of the license. To make it clear, Tedeschi's never owned the license. Pendleton Ventures Inc. owned the license. Before that, um, I can't remember what former owner's name is I bought it from. Um, I can show you clear text messages from myself, to myself and Steve for captains that it was made very clear that the license was never part of the deal with Tedeschi's. I paid for the license out of my pocket. It was always my property. At the behest of the board allowing me to operate. Uh, I would speak in favor of uh, Vivek for two reasons. When we were here last time, the board spoke about a certain kind of business coming into town and wanting to operate. Obviously, there's going to be convenience stores, but you're looking for stores that are willing to evolve, move forward. He obviously wants to move forward as a business. The tobacco business is dying. We all know that in the convenience store business. It won't be a factor for long. Most towns are going 21 plus, eliminating <coughs> flavors, all kinds of options. Fevec obviously sees this and is trying to move forward in a different direction to stay in business and grow his business. The other thing, I'll speak for him as a businessman and as, with integrity. After the last meeting when he was turned down, he could have backed out of our deal. On paper, the purchase and sale was over. It was for that location. We had a handshake and spoken agreement that he would pursue it and he could pursue it for four months and he expressed interest and fulfilled the handshake agreement we had no legal obligation to continue. He could have asked for his deposit back and just called it a day and walked away. But he said, you know, he gave me my word and he stuck to it. I think that counts for businessmen in town to be in your business with going forward. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Good evening, um, and thank you for offering us the opportunity to um, voice our opposition to the transfer of location. Um, my name is Christiana Papadapoulou. I am a registered nurse by profession, but in marrying Stelios, um, I have worked many, many hours behind the counter at Captain. 
Um, and it's been my great good fortune to do so um, because I've become a member of the community. And um, the, the best thing about North Reading is that it's multi-generational. And so I meet the adults who tell me stories about how they had their first teenage dates and captains. And now they're the parents to the kids that fill our store with laughter on Friday nights. And um, as the daughter and granddaughter of police officers, I, um, I'm really happy to spend time with our police and firefighters and state police officers both on their dinner breaks and when they come in on their precious days off with their families. And when they do that, they'll, you know, they trust us to leave their kids eating their pizza while they pop next door to get whatever it is they need. And also to let their kids pop next door for their post pizza candy um, so they can have five minutes of uh, adult time. And, and that, that certainty of safety, um, you can't really find that anywhere in this day and age, but you find it with us because we've been there for so long. And, um, you know, I, they, we have over 300 of our customers who signed the petition uh, to oppose the transfer of location, and we would have hundreds more, but we just found out about the hearing late last week. Um, and that's because there's no more community-minded person than Stelios. Um, you know, his, his integrity in running a business is unquestioned and totally supported by the residents of North Reading. Um, I, uh, I worked lunches in the days and weeks after Tedeschi closed, and people were astonished and at times very frustrated, and they would come in and say, what happened to the little peach? And so I had to ask the guys what that meant because I had no idea. And so I, with that, I recognized just how long those two stores have been in the community and how people rely on us and they have an expectation. And so they said, oh, God, i got to get back in my car. And, you know, who wants to drive into the gas station if you don't need gas because that parking is a mess? And who wants to go down the street? They're, they just appreciate that we were there and we've been there for, for so many decades. And I think the, the best example of that is on Sunday afternoons, you know, week after week, year after year, our customers come in, they pick up their pizzas and they go next door and they buy their beverages. And you know, sometimes it's even to the point where it's like it's the tradition, but it's also the superstition because they would say after Tedeschi's close, ah, if the pats lose, I'm gonna, you know, that's that's it. That's that's what we're asking for. It's it's the continuity and the convenience um, that what they said about location. They pull into where we are, they get what they need, and they get to go home. You know, everybody's working harder, more hours, less time at home now. But we're just asking that you keep that continuity and the convenience for the people of North Reading who, you know, who know our business, know, know the location, and um, so we're asking you to vote against the transfer of the location. Thank you very much. And um, I'm, I'm not sure how to present <laughs> this. Thank you very much. Anyone else in the audience have any comments? We have been there for 42 years. Captain Peter has been there for 42 years. Please uh, get up to the podium. I've been there for 29 years. I think uh, there's, there have been seven uh, wine and beer for close to 42 years because they told me it's open since 1975. It's uh, another thing, I don't know if, the, if you know the location down the street. There is only one exit. As my lawyer, uh, Kenneth Dorothy says, there are very few parking spaces, very difficult to come in and out, yeah. and it's very difficult on that specific crossing on, on uh, Lowell Street. Our place is easier to come in and out, and it's a, it's a, it's a center for most four towns to go, Reading, North Andover, Dover, and Wilmington. So it's, uh, I encourage you to, uh, to consider to give us the license back to our location. Thank you. Anyone else have questions? Can I just respond uh, to this? You, we tried, you may, of course. We, we tried. We tried to have a license here. We had a hearing. And the board said no. 
I mean, it's not like we didn't try. The board said because of the restrictions on the deed that Mr. Papadopoulos, who I admire, I think he's a great businessman and he's a, he's a very good guy, but the, 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 the property he bought had a restriction. It said you can't have a full convenience store. We appeared in front of the board. That's correct. And we got turned down because you said, you know, we don't want that. We don't want a limited use. So it's not like we didn't think of that first. We did. And we, and you, you said no. And we said, okay, well, you know. So uh, the, the suggestion that, that I'm hearing tonight, the opposition is based on, well, you know, keep the, keep the license where it was. You've already spoken in that. That's why we're, we're here today. Um, so, you know, so what I'm presenting to, to the board today is, you know, and, and this would be highly unfair to Mr. Pendleton because if, if you deny this, then he's not going to, because you've already said no to this location. If you say no to the new location, he had, he's out of options. So, um, but I presented, you know, with, you know, a first class uh, operator and a great location and, and a convenience store like you wanted. But I, I, I just, I just want to remind the board, we, we did try this and you've said no. And, and so that's, you know, that's where we are today. And that's why we're here today. So. Go ahead. When I first asked uh, Mr. Fivek why you were denied, the, uh, he told me some reasons. And after I came to the, to the lady Karen, she told me because they applied the wrong way. Okay, so it's, and ask him, why did they do that? So you go ask and ask my lawyer, and he con contacted Mr. Dimakis, and, and they never told me on paper wh what did they apply for. So I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's because the limited use. And I'm not opposing only the transfer because to stay only for us. It's not safe down there. If they don't have enough parking, and it's easier for us to keep the license because we have so many business, so many people, uh, they're buying from us from that building, from the location. Uh, uh, we want to continue the business and, and service the customers of North Reading. This, it's not the denied because uh, they applied wrong. That's what Karen told me. On applications, he, he applied for, they applied for convenience store. That's what they say. It's not what they applied and you deny them. He applied on the application as a convenience store. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments, new comments from anyone in the audience? Uh, if not, I will close the public hearing. This is Madam Bill. I just want to, if I, if I might, um, explain what, what the board heard and the petition and the additional time that we gave the petitioner. And by the way, the pizza there, it's the best pizza. We go there all the time. My children love it. Um, and it is a convenient spot and everything like that. But the, the um, place next door to you was a convenience store, Tedeschi's, which sold much more than just alcohol. And when we heard the petition, we recognized that when you acquired that um, spot, you acquired it with a permanent restriction in the deed that it would not be able to be a convenience store and that's very specific it's it's on record and it was a non-compete type of thing that was put into the to the deed in a permanent way so when we heard this we gave the petitioner the opportunity to look at it again because that's what the transfer document said but that wasn't the only reason why it was denied because the because of the board collectively felt that it, to have a liquor license there should be more than just selling the liquor, liquor at the location. And now it's turned into a tobacco, vape, uh, smoke shop type of an operation with the lottery. And the lottery was a big piece of that and the board said you don't need a liquor license to sell the lottery. So that was one piece of it. But the other important piece, and to me is the same reason that holds true for this new proposed location, um, is that there is no public need for it because of the number of retail licenses, not just in the direct vicinity of where the former location is, but also in the direct vicinity of where Richdale's is. So we just denied the request for that basis. There was no public need to have the license because there are so many 
other establishments where people can go to purchase liquor. And also, there's really no change from the board's former denial at that same Lowell Street location than there is. The demographics haven't changed. The same places still exist. It's the same reason why I would be not in favor of it, not for the reasons you presented, but for the reason that there is no public need, in my opinion, for another license on Lowell Road when there's so many in the area. Mr. Prisco. Mr. Gilberto, can I ask you a few questions? Uh, what's the what's the date this expires? This legal license. The licenses would renew uh, as of January first under state law. Under January first. So by the time, if let's say we hypothetically approve this, it goes to ABCC next. Yes. And how long does that process take? Depending upon the uh, extent of the ABCC's background, um, you know, it, you could be looking at 30 days, something like that, potentially. It's hard for me to suppose. So we're talking about a license that only has 38 days that's going to go through a process that's going to take at least 30 days. So we're really talking about approving a license that will ex basically execute for eight days. It doesn't seem to make sense to me. So, um, I don't know. I'm just a little confused about it. Can I, can I <coughs> the public hands over. No, just. Uh, let the attorney clarify it. If he can clarify the point. Uh, yes, but we'll give him a chance to do yeah. that. But it needs to be controlled. So, uh, what you're saying is, just so I understand, what you're saying is that. We, when we transfer a license, it gets transferred, right? During its period of performance. And it, in its period of performance, you says ends January 1st. We transfer the uh, license be full without ever taking that into consideration. So the license, the license was renewed in December of last year for a term to end December 31st. And it would, you know, the annual license renewal for all liquor licenses would take place in all likelihood in December, as it has every every year. I should say the renewal process. But you have to have a run a business running, and if we act upon this transfer and this board determines to approve it, that it it goes into next year. So it doesn't really, if he's acting within that time frame that we gave him to come back to the board, he's fine if, if it's approved. If it's not approved, it, there's no license for him to renew because there's no active business there. So under the renewal process, you're talking about one thing, but under the transfer process, you're talking about something totally different. Okay, okay so the point you're making is that the existing license is to a business that basically has gone away and there is a time limit to which the owner of that license has to put it to good use one way or another. Well, he came to the board and the board talked to him about canceling that license and he wanted that additional time frame to come mm -hmm. back here and he's done that. Yeah. So we denied it and he talked with us again and then we gave him the additional time. So. Renewal, you have to file an affidavit that says, you know, we have business up and running in this location. Mm -hmm. He can't do that. But this is his alternative that he's come, we've already said, come back, if you can come back within the six, I think we gave him 60, 60 days. days. Mm -hmm. And he's done that. He's so. done that. So, and that's the purpose of this transfer. Oh, correct. Mm -hmm. So. Mr. Chair, just, as a, just from a timing standpoint, to, to Michael's point, it, you know, kind of tight as far as the renewal timeline and the end of the year when it expires. But, you know, if the board were to approve this transfer, the new license holder would then seek a renewal, effective January 1st. Uh, if we were to approve the transfer, it would just be perfunctory for the ABCC would just, from a workload standpoint, handle it whenever they could. But that would just be routine. Um, if we were to deny it, and then the denial is appealed, our ability to issue the license, my guess would be delayed. 
because it's under appeal as to whether or not we would have denied it appropriately. So that, you know, the license may become available January 1st, but it really wouldn't become available until the ABCC, if the applicant were denied, were to, uh, to appeal that decision. So it wouldn't be available until that's adjudicated. So. <coughs> Do we have a, other retail licenses available, or is this the last retail license we have? There are none that are currently available uh -huh. for, for this type of license. Okay. Jeffrey? Yeah, I have a, a couple questions um, with regard to both locations. You have uh, Captain Pizza at North and Main. How many parking spaces do you have there? Captain Pizza, 16, 16, have 16? plus uh, 8 in the back, 24. 24 spaces. Two for two establishments. For two establishments. Right, right. Okay. But but for, for your, how many parking spaces do you have? Captain, Captain, Captain Pizza, Pizza, yes. Yes, uh, we don't have a number of witches for Captain Pizza, which is for uh, the, de uh, the next door, uh, Lucky Market. Okay. So it's the whole thing, it's uh, 16 in front and 8 in the back. Okay, so you, there's a total of 24 available. Uh, at Richdale, how many parking spaces do you have there? Oh, it's in a class. I know, but how many do you have? We um, think between 30 and 40 is that the front and back. Yes. I think they said 32. What? I, think that, I thought you said 32. Th is that what you, I think it's, you said 32 earlier. I, I didn't, I, 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 I don't think I addressed that. I the know. gentleman over here, you said that they have. If I counted correctly, I okay. said that. I don't so, okay. but. I think there's 10 businesses there. With, I Between 30 and 40. Now, you have, yeah. you have two entrances, correct? You have an entrance on North Street. I have two entrances, yes. Two, North Street yes. and Main. Yeah. Correct. And how many entrances do you have? One. He has two entrances. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. He has two. He has, uh, he has one as you go you opposite, explain, opposite. You this from the same side. Though. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. He yeah. still has two. Okay. Um, okay. And then um, uh, with regard to the, the uh, uh, your location uh, at Tedeschi's, uh, that was Tedeschi's, The last meeting, and, and that was uh, mentioned uh, just earlier, that uh, what was there before cannot be there now. So in other words, the convenience store that was there, which was Tedeschi's. The convenience store, uh, sir, uh, the, dif the, the definition of convenience store and the operation where we have right now, uh, Mr. Patel, it's Jaden Patel, is the only thing we cannot sell is milk and bread and food for that location. Everything else you can sell. So we try to make it like, it's so, I, that's what I don't Just understand why, why we don't understand, yeah, why we cannot keep, remain the beer and wine license. The only thing we cannot sell is bread and milk. The, 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 the convenience store that would that's be next to you. That's the definition. We cannot sell foods like that, milk, milk and food products, but, and groceries. And groceries, yeah. That was so, so you, so, the type of store that house. the type of store that can go there is through the chair. So yeah. let Mr. Yule ask. How many chairs? Finish you asking you? his no, no, question. No, no, no. Just hold on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Bob. Go ahead. Um, the type of store that you've had there for the past it's been there. What did you say? Forty years. All right. The, uh, and, uh, yeah, the Deskies and Little Peach was there like forty years or something like that. Right. All right. Uh, that type of store will not be the type of store that will be next to you. That's correct. Okay, so, so it will be a different... The restriction says no convenience store. And if you see what the definition of convenience store is, no groceries, milk, or bread, everything else. That's the only restriction we have. If you see what's the, what does it mean convenience store, that's the difference. And that's why you're asking, why not we're allowed to have the wine and beer? Yes, we had for 30 years, for 42 years. And Mr. Pedro, as you told me before, he was never making any money on the convenience store. He was making 30,000 a year and even less. 
And a lot of customers told me and complained yeah. that the milk was off. That, That's why okay. they, they never like to go there for these things. We don't okay. want the milk right. and groceries right now. Because All we right. cannot have them. Okay. Okay. I uh, think, though, I think during the last hearing, when we went through the document, right. the lease, right, we interpret it as being far more restrictive than what you're telling Th that's us. That's right. No, that's no, right. we didn't interpret it. The attorney came and said yeah. they didn't realize it, but that's exactly what it was. Yeah. It cannot be a convenience yeah. store. Right. We right. didn't interpret that uh, at uh, all. Okay. But that is it was the really hearing. clear. That's not that what the came out of the on. meeting. No. But this hearing that's isn't correct. about this. This right. hearing no, is not about that. No, I understand. Which is We've denied. lost sight of why we're having a hearing. No, no. So the gentleman here is trying to make a case. I, but, I know. But they're keeping the license because they can operate a store with a beer and wine license there. And that's not part of this hearing. Right? I feel bad, but it was the last hearing. But sure have. In, in the hearing, we, uh, you know, we, we, we have to hear people that are against the transfer, and he's making that point. So I, I don't find him. No, no. I know, just okay. the There's nothing we can do about it. But I don't think the board yeah. should be basing the denial upon that basis. We already denied it at that location right. and gave the statement of I reason why. That. So. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Steele. Yeah. Uh, if if I may continue, though, um, with, with with regard to, and with all due respect, with um, regard to identifying public need. Right, I was the dissenting vote. I supported the um, transfer, oh, transfer uh, back in uh, August or whenever it was. I supported that. I, I, and I think I, I believe I, I made this comment that um, need or public need is really determined by the public. Uh, if someone's going to open up a store, regardless of the type of store it is, the public is either going to go or they're not going to go. And I think that's a decision that should be left up to them. So from my vantage point, it doesn't make a difference to me whether this, the establishment is uh, on North Street, North and Main, or whether it's on Lowell. For me, it doesn't make a difference because I would support uh, the establishment uh, of a small business whether it be new or the expansion of a small business. So, okay, but yeah, this public hearing is for the Lowell Street location. I understand that. So, but that's my perspective. Mr. O'Leary, you want to weigh in? A uh, couple of comments, I guess. Uh, first of all, I Sorry, I was out of state on the 22nd of August. I missed the meeting. Uh, the last, I know, the last <laughs> meeting, I know. Go away, you know, once a year. Um, and, again, and again, when I, when I look at applica applications like this, you know, it does come down to a matter of the public's convenience and expectations. And part of the convenience and expectations, were, as far as I'm concerned, was, and again, I wasn't here, but my guess is, Based upon what I knew, you know, I probably would have voted favorably on the previous petition because, again, the expectation of the general public and populace is that, you know, they can go to Captain's Pizza, park next door, buy a six pack of beer, and a bottle of wine, and that's been going on for uh, 35, 40 years. Uh, but that's been done, and uh, the applicant decided not to appeal that. So, uh, so what's before us now is, is an application. Um, for the beer and wine license at a location that this board previously, about 15 years ago, already considered and denied also. Um, again, the uh, rationale behind that was, again, a matter of uh, public need and convenience, uh, location to a uh, nearby neighborhood. Um, at the time, had some uh, notation from the police chief at the time indicating some concern. It was, I believe part of it was uh, the egress, uh, interest in egress and uh, traffic uh, patterns uh, for that particular location. Um, I don't know that the demographics, I know that the location hasn't changed. Uh, again, well, one thing it is lacking right now is I, uh, we don't have any of the uh, neighborhood residents here expressing any concerns at this particular point in time. But, you know, we, we uh, deliberated uh, long and hard previously. Um, 
It was appealed to the ABCC. The town uh, defended uh, the position that the board took at the time, and the ABCC um, upheld the decision of the local licensing board. Uh, again, I don't see the location as, as having changed. I don't see the uh, public needs uh, having changed. Um, and again, I and, I and I don't know if you know if the license becomes available. You know, who else would apply for it? Uh, but um, right now, you know, I, I again I was on the board at the time, and I was in opposition then, and I don't see any uh, good reason for me to to change my mind. Um, from I guess it was around 15 years ago, 14 years ago, so that uh, you know, I, Mr. Prisco, I'll ahead. wait to you. Well, first, I want to thank you, Catherine, for explaining the, um, the transfer of Rusty expiration because that was helpful for me. Um, but I will say, you know, kind of touched upon, I'm going to touch upon a little bit of what you were saying, Steve, and that is the need of the community. And I'm not going to be voting in favor of this transfer because and I look at the need of the community and I look at the amount of liquor stores that are nearby this location and I look at the future. And we've been spending a tremendous amount of time on economic development. We're trying to hopefully see some e increase in economic development very soon here in the community. I would rather allow this liquor license to expire and have it at our disposal that in the future if something comes up of, I think, more need for the town, I'd rather vote in favor of it when I see a need. I don't see the need here. So I'm, for that reason, I'm not going to be voting in favor of it. Any other board members have a comment? Right. Just that, and I don't want to speak for everyone else on the board, but I, from now sitting with the board members, I believe we are all pro-business on this board. So I, I don't want there to be the implication that because we may be against something because of public need that we're not pro-business. We're not taking a business away. Again, it's the same situation as the last time. We're not taking a business away from anybody. The business was bought by uh, another company. So it's bought out by another company. I just want to put that on the... Is that it? Uh, okay. Jeffrey? Yeah. I think Steve wants just to say just in relation to the, uh, the, the police department, uh, their recommendation. Fire department, I think. Adam. I know that the fire department had some concerns because they hadn't uh, had the opportunity to fully, uh, or they had some concerns in relation to uh, doors and storage and things of that nature. And then um, they were looking for us to hold until they completed, uh, until the completion of some of these other uh, violations or non-compliance issues are taken care of. Again, I, I, I don't know whether, the, I can't really tell whether the fire department has had adequate time to go in and and look at it or not. Additionally, I, I would like some some additional input before we make a final determination uh, from the police department in relation to the adequate access and egress in light of the density of um, the building or the, the plaza that's there. Uh, I think that uh, that could have could have an impact, and I don't believe it was uh, fully addressed. So uh, you know, if we're, again, I've expressed my, my opinion, but again, I'm open to um, have some more input from public safety in relation to it, uh, the specific location that's being uh, proposed here. So I would like some additional comment from the police department if, if we're so inclined to, to continue the hearing. Uh, if not, we can take a vote. But, uh, I'd like more specific in input from the police department and then uh, follow up from the fire department as to whether or not the uh, concerns um, have been addressed as they pointed out. And again, I don't even know if the applicant has been made aware of the fire department's concerns. I, I, have you been made aware as to what the concerns of the fire department were? No. Okay. So, I mean, 
Mr. Through you, Mr. Chairman. My understanding is that the fire chief was on the premises last week and communicated with the manager on duty what the concerns were. Want me to state what they are? Yeah, we, we can certainly read the, the concerns, but so I know they were conveyed personally by the chief. It says here that the fire extinguisher is out of date, exit door altered inappropriately, storage in the boiler room, locked uh, boiler room, and then there's just a comment to hold until these have been completed. And then and the other thing, and the other thing, the building inspector said that there's mm -hmm. some deadbolts on the doors, which are a violation of a building code, which need to be removed and and fixed. So I mean that's a violation anyway. But Steve, I, I view all those items as things that are all rectifiable. The issue yeah. that you brought up regarding the police, yeah, and I think the we traffic need traffic pattern and that stuff. I think is is clearly right. something that we should. Because we passed these things in the past that make yeah, subject to regulatory additional on right. meeting regulation yeah. requirements. So, uh, but the the point you brought up, I think, is is one that uh, if you haven't made up your mind already, would help one way or the other. Yes, Mr. Prisca. It's an existing business that operates every day. So why would the parking become an issue now? Well, well my guess is that they'll be anticipating an increase in business. You know, at the, at the location. Why would you be Augmenting it with uh, additional, you know, and again, I don't was, know what the was, what the current concerns are anyway, based upon the current tenancy either. I mean, there's been some change in tenancy there too, and that would change uh, traffic patterns and the level of traffic and parking. So, oh, I mean, I so, just yeah. think the building and, owner's and, done and a I pretty think, good job over there. I think it's important there. for the board to have um, all pertinent information uh, prior to rendering a decision particularly if it's not favorable. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Yeah. Um, I agree with you pretty much everything that you just said. But I, I, you know, I don't know what the consensus of the board is. We, we seem to be a little uh, spread out here. Um, I don't want to put anybody through all this additional time and effort if we know as a board that we're not basically going to renew the license. I mean, why would we put them through well, that? I, I, I would say this, Jeff. Uh, mm -hmm. The petitioner has the right to go to the ABC if right. we deny it. Mm -hmm. And if we have more information to back up why, if that's the wishes of the board to do, deny it, I think that would be helpful in terms of staying off an appeal. That would be, I don't know if Mr. O'Leary was headed down that path or not, but. I mean, I, well, I'm from my perspective, I can't be convinced that the, uh, uh, this particular business is needed in that, that area, but uh, the petitioner does have a right to appeal to the ABC for the license and uh, if I go to the ABC to justify our position the more information I have substantive information that I have uh, the better off we are in acting on behalf of the town I'd say that's appropriate I would agree with that so our options here are to stay our decision to our next meeting and get information from the police to deny it or approve it. What are the wishes of the board at this point? I move to continue the public hearing on the uh, application of whatever the applicant is yet. Before us. Yeah, before <laughs> us. Uh, and our next meeting date is when? November 21st. Uh, November 21st at 8, 8 p.m. Oh, we have tax time. Uh, okay. I would say 9 p.m. 9 p.m. And I would second that. Second by Mr. Yule. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. Motion carries. Three to two. Next item on our agenda is public comment. Anyone here for public comment? FY 2018 budget preview and schedule. Mr. Gilberto.
Bear with me one moment while I turn on the technology. <laughs> Prisco is uh, asked for five minute well, recess. Kind of we've been going at it. <laughs> the last three, four hours. It wasn't him, it was the other guy. <laughs> I know, he's the one that's suffering. 10 o'clock already. Go ahead. Yeah, he's the one that's suffering. You can turn the heat on now. I don't want a little bit of heat right now. <laughs> Ruffle anyone's feathers. No, I, I know, I know. I've been doing this to so I thought I'd seen it all, but you just always said the ability to surprise. <laughs> like that. That's not necessarily a good thing either. Oh well. At least we're keeping you. Keeping me on my toe. parking spaces <laughs> no but they do have the other place you you can get into and out of it just go in the same direction yes Recess is over, Mr. Gilbert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So one benefit of the of the recess is that uh, I have to uh, pull up a summary slide rather than go through that very painful spreadsheet that you all have in your packets. Appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, I just I, I will highlight some of the uh, the, the biggest items uh, in the FY 2018 budget projection. And basically, what you have in front of here is a summary slide that shows kind of the major cost and, uh, and revenue drivers that we're looking at right now. And again, it is early in the budget process, but uh, this is really kind of the kickoff in the process as we'll be asking departments, boards, and commissions to submit their requests. So just going from the top uh, of that slide, you see the tax levy with the projected new growth. Right now, we're estimating it at $500,000. The debt exclusion, which is uh, previously excluded debt uh, that is used for the debt service for previous projects, construction projects, 
Uh, I'll note that the state aid, unrestricted aid, is uh, being held level right now, and that's certainly based out of the concern over the condition of the state's budget. Um, certainly we've heard from the governor that, that we should not expect 9C cuts during this fiscal year, uh, which would certainly have a dramatic effect on the budget. Uh, but uh, we, we're a, a little concerned about projecting an increase, at least when it comes to unrestricted state aid. At Chapter 78, we've got a modest increase projected at $40,000 for fiscal year 2018. Um, just jumping down, uh, we have a, a modest uh, local receipts projection that we've taken off based on trends for the past few years, up to $4.784 million. And then uh, looking at uh, our projections, we do see a decrease in the other financial uh, sources, which we can detail uh, later on during the budget development. So the bottom line is, uh, without getting too far into the detail, is we certainly have concerns looking into fiscal year 2018. And I believe these are things that we previewed during the budget hearing in uh, April of 2016 uh, with regard to the challenges that we would face in this current, this upcoming budget year. And uh, through the work at the financial planning team, we will work to try to resolve those, uh, those issues over the next uh, six months through the budget process. But uh, this really is kind of the snapshot picture at this point in time. The other thing I wanted to do here is just take an opportunity to go over the calendar for fiscal year. 2018 budget before, development? Before, yes. Excuse me. Before you go on, uh, in, in the news, it seems to be reporting that auto sales have taken a, a big dip this past year, which will reflect itself in excise tax revenue. I know that it's been growing pretty steadily, mm -hmm. but. Uh, my guess is it's either going to level off or drop off a little bit. I hope I'm wrong. But. I, I think we'll have to look at those economic indicators in terms of our projections for, for 18. I mean, each year we've made modest adjustments to the revenue projection. Uh, looking at, into the, uh, the upcoming budget year, and um, you know, they've, they've held true, fortunately, and they've come to fruition. But obviously, as the fluctuation of the economy occurs, this is one of those areas that is certainly very Michael. Just a quick question on the lower right-hand corner of the slide mm -hmm. for the schools. Is that red, the delta between the FY17 and 18? No. no it, what, it, is it, the, what is it? Yeah, because it doesn't work. I, I don't want to put too much attention with regard to that bottom slide, only because the finance director is, here, is not here to speak to it. Those reflect projection uh, at an earlier point in the budget process. Um, I think that it, it would be fair to say that there is certainly concern with regard to the available revenue and uh, its ability to support the projected budget increases for both the town budget and the school department budget uh, going into fiscal year 2018. And, and, you know, then that, that's not necessarily something that's new at this stage of the budget process. Yeah. But we continue to mo monitor that over the, the, uh, the work of the financial planning team in the next few months. Okay. So those numbers are just a working I, I number? Yeah, I'd say that that's a working draft. I wouldn't be, you know, I, Okay. Certainly, I, I, I'm not in a position to speak too much to their reliability. I just grabbed this slide very quickly as a kind of way to expedite the discussion. Mr. Chairman, the other thing I'd like to do is take a look at the budget schedule. Yeah. That's in here, right? Yes, it is in here. Packet. Just the, the things that I will note is that we'll be distributing guidelines to departments uh, beginning on Monday of next week with the budget requests due to the finance department by December 14th. There'll be a review that will take place over the two months thereafter and then we expect to have the town administrator budget recommendations available on February 10th, 2017. The first budget hearing, the joint budget meeting uh, with DPW, fire and police is scheduled for Saturday, February 25th and that is in line with the past schedules that we have followed. And then we have three additional hearings scheduled on Monday evenings, March 6th and 20th, and April 3rd. And that's based on the regular board schedule of meetings on the first and third Mondays of the month. And then just moving forward, um, the end of that process would be the votes of the Selectmen and Finance Committee relative to recommendations to be included in the warrant, which would be, need to be done no later than Thursday, May 11th, so that the uh, warrant can be distributed to the printer the next day. 
and town meeting, currently projected for June 5th, 2017, although we'll ask the board to formally vote on that in January as per the town bylaw. That really concludes the presentation. We'll be working diligently behind the scenes to pull the information together. Uh, I want to thank the board for its efforts on Thursday evening to uh, get through the, uh, the goals and objectives for fiscal year 2018 and beyond uh, so that I can provide that information to the department heads what? to be considered in their yeah, budget packet. It's there somewhere because I saw it. Michael, where? where oh, you, you got it. I found it. You found it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I know over the weekend I found it. And uh, it's not in the main board packet, right? It should have been in the packet, Mr. Chairman. If it was not, I apologize. No, it's in here. I found it. I kept going by it. Oh. It looked different. Never mind. That's the legal bills and then the... Yeah. Here it is. Okay. Yeah, it's in, it's in here. That concludes the presentation. Thank you. Okay. This will be presented at the financial planning team meeting next week? This is a representative of the information that's been reviewed by the financial planning team. Okay. team. It's not been uh, altered since the last meeting on okay. October 12th, to my knowledge. Uh, one no, thing that I, I... Meeting that the school department is more or less in line with these numbers, these dates. Again, it's taken from the, the paperwork that we've reviewed, okay. with the exception of the, the red numbers in red that, that I cannot necessarily immediately corroborate. Okay. Uh, again, the finance director not being here this evening. So I just want to confirm we're doing our Saturday meeting February 25th as projected in this schedule. That's right. correct. That's my recommendation for board. Mr. Chairman, one thing through you that I would note is that the uh, uh, we had the update from the actuary relative to our OPEB liability at the meeting over the summer. And I do expect that at the next financial planning team meeting next week, we will update the uh, financial uh, plan to reflect the updated actuary number based on the board's previously adopted strategy of holding, holding aside money for new hire employees. And we can review that with the financial planning team and then bring it back to the board as well. Okay, any questions for the town administrator? Okay, we have a vote to approve and file home rule petition for civil service. Mr. Panabelli? Mr. Chairman, I move to approve special legislation rescinding civil service for police officers of all ranks as authorized by the October 17, 2016 town meeting and to petition the general court and the governor to approve this action. Second. Is that you, Jeff? That was me. That was Steve, okay. Thank I was you. chatting. <laughs> <laughs> On the motion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We have one more vote to approve and file home rule petition for the MWRA. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve special legislation as authorized by the June 6, 2016 town meeting to amend section 8D of chapter 372 of the acts of 1984 to permit an extension of the MWRA water system into the town of North Reading and to petition the general court and the governor to approve this action. Second by Mr. Yule. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. We have legal bills. They're spread out in, I think, two sections of the... Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve legal bills in the amount of $8,329.64 as follows. Copeland and Page, PC General, 5323-64. Copeland and Page PC Labor 3006 for a total of $8,329.64. Second. So I must you. I have a question. If if we were to take a look at legal bills through October. I guess this is September, right? 
Yeah, I believe you have it through September there, so yes. the one quarter. Not, never mind. I was thinking that, wondering how we were looking based on the annual budget. We can conduct a review and provide the information to the board for the next meeting. Yeah. Certainly. It's, for the it's only a quarter, so. On the motion, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous? We have minutes. Mr. Chairman, there's a second part to that. For the September, that was the August. This is another motion for September legal bills. Oh, okay. All right. That's all. I did see two separate sections. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve legal bills in the amount of $13,215.96 as follows. Copeland and Page, PC General, $9,195.46. Copeland and Page, PC Labor, $2,294. Copeland and Page, PC Water, $388.50. And Thompson West, $1,338 for a total of $13,215.96. Do we hear a second? Second. Second one is still. That was one of the reasons why I had raised that question. It was the second one, was $13,000 popped up. Were you, was were you trying to track how far we were well, last uh, year? Well, we have a legal budget, right? You know, you spend so much a month, and I just was trying to get a sense of where we where we are. If we're looking at it from the point of view, if we spent 25 percent, then we can feel okay. If we spent 35 or 40 percent, then we have to stop paying attention. On the motion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, there's an APD management. Mm -hmm. It's also another motion to approve. Which one is that? Billing. It's not in, I think it's. It's on the investigation. Oh, yes. Okay. So, Mr. Chairman, through you, so this is a bill for the uh, right. town's outside investigator relative to the Department of Public Works. Uh, I'll provide an update under the town administrator's report relative to the investigation. And just to <coughs> note, we've encumbered the funds from fiscal year 17, excuse me, 16 for invoice number one, and that invoice number two would be paid from fiscal year 17 funds. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve bills for APD Management, Inc. in the amount of $7,380 as follows. Invoice number one, services through 63016, $5,400. Invoice number two, services from July 1, 2016 to October 16, 2016, $1,980. Second. Second one, Mr. Yule, any discussion? I'll just comment then. I guess I'll look for the quarterly uh, total against our total budget. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous? Okay. Go through legal bills. Minutes of September 19th. Legal session. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the September 19th, 2016 regular session minutes as written. Second. Second by Mr. Ewell. On the motion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous? We have minutes of October 3rd regular session. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the October 3rd, 2016 regular session minutes as written. Second. Second by Mr. Ewell. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. 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 Unanimous? We have the uh, same date, executive session, October 3rd, Mrs. Mattoli? Mm -hmm. No. There's only one executive session on the 3rd. There's no regular session for the 3rd. No. Oh, yeah, regular. My apologies. My mistake. Can I ask that we um, postpone the vote on this because there's something recorded in here that um, I think just needs a correction. Okay, Mr. Gilberto, would you okay. make sure it's on our executive session meeting for our next meeting? Certainly. October 12, 2016. 
Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the October 12, 2016 regular session minutes as written. Second. Second by Mr. Yu. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. We have an executive session for that date. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the October 12, 2016 executive session minutes as written. Second. Second by Mr. Yule. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. And we have October 17th regular session meeting. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the October 17, 2016 regular session minutes as written. Second. Second by Mr. Ewell. Any discussion on that? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Town Administrator's report, Mr. Gilbert. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, the Department of Public Works has submitted an application to the State Department of Transportation's Small Bridge Capital Program to reconstruct the Park Street Bridge over Martins Brook. Uh, a corresponding capital improvement project request has been submitted to the Capital Improvement Planning Committee. And I just want to thank Representative Jones for his advocacy for funding for this program at the state level. And uh, we look forward to a response from MassDOT later this fall. Second, uh, Water Superintendent Mark Clark and I attended a drought forum hosted by Senator Bruce Tarr on October 21st. I've included uh, in the packet a copy of the agenda. I'm pleased to report that the MWRA identified North Reading for its proactive approach to address water supply challenges prior to the current drought that's affecting the region. <coughs> Third, the town has submitted the attached peer community assessment questionnaire in response to a request by the town of Reading. I noted that some of the feedback was cut off in the packet, so I'll circulate by email uh, a more legible copy because I don't think you were able to read all of the comments in each of the particular areas. But I'd like to thank the town planner, Danielle McKnight, for her efforts to complete that, that form. And finally, Mr. Chairman, I have a statement I'd like to read relative to the um, investigation of the Department of Public Works. As the board and the community know, a D DPW employee and a DPW contractor were arrested as a result of a North Reading Police Department criminal drug investigation on Friday, March 4th, 2016. In addition to the criminal investigation, a separate administrative investigation was initiated at that time. By March 15th, 2016, eight DPW employees and the director had resigned. Both the criminal and administrative investigations have been ongoing since that time, and I offer the following as an update as to the status of the administrative investigation. As a result of numerous interviews of staff and the review of records conducted by the administrative investigator, the investigator found sufficient evidence indicating that certain, but not all, DPW employees were purchasing drugs and using drugs while working, and evidence of contractor preferential treatment. Additionally, the investigator found that a preponderance of the evidence indicates that there were violations of departmental policies by some DPW employees, a failure or lack of supervision within DPW, and that there was an attempt to interfere with the administrative investigation by a DPW employee or employees. The resignations in March negated the need to address discipline with many of the employees implicated. Additional appropriate disciplinary action based on the administrative investigation is being taken with the remaining employees, employees as appropriate. Finally, as a result of the investigation, an employee has been transferred out of the DPW to another department. As these are matters of personnel, I'm unable to comment further. Please note that the findings that I have identified are separate and distinct from the criminal investigation and its findings, if any. The findings of the administrative investigation will be forwarded to law enforcement. While the administrative investigation has been concluded, we remain prepared to investigate further any potential future information or allegations that may come to light. I wish to thank Chief Michael Murphy, Administrative Investigator Al Donovan, Finance Director Liz Rourke, and Town, Town Council Darren Klein, and the men and women of the Department of Public Works who cooperatively assisted in this investigation. The public's patience over the past seven months is greatly appreciated. During this time, our streets have been plowed, sanded and swept, potholes filled, fields maintained, grading perform performed, brush cut, and countless other day-to-day -day services have been provided. 
I wish to thank the remaining men and women of the Department of Public Works and the Town Hall for their hard work and dedication and for their cooperation during the administrative investigation. As I have previously stated, it is critically important to note that the findings of the investigation are not indicative of town employees as a whole. The past seven months have shown that we are blessed with professional staff at all levels, and I thank them for their patience and understanding as we have conducted this review. I also thank Acting Director of Public Works Robert Moreland for his assistance over the summer, and I look forward to the future of the Department of Public Works under new Director Andrew Lafferty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions or comments? Anything else on town administration report? No, sir. <clears throat> Old new business, Michael? Yes, I wanted to uh, <clears throat> just start off by uh, saying goodbye to Sheila Strunovan. She's resigned now from the, from the town and is moving on to bigger and better things, but her time with the town has been extremely valuable and we will, she will be missed and uh, her family will be missed there. And I know they'll still be volunteering and participating, but um, her vibrant attitude around town will be missed around town hall. I uh, wanted to just remind everybody listening and here on the board that the tree lighting is November 27th, 2 to 4 <coughs> p.m. They are looking for sponsors to adopt a tree to help fund this event. It's been a wonderful event every year. And if you're interested, if you have a business or you just as a family wanted to uh, sponsor a tree and adopt a tree, uh, this is a great opportunity to do that. And you can reach out to the chamber and go ahead and do that. That's all I have. Mr. Chairman. Just a note, yeah. thank you, uh, Selectman, for bringing up uh, Sheila's uh, departure. She certainly is going to be sorely missed and very, very happy for her, very sad for us. Yeah. Uh, I'm pleased to advise the board that uh, she has expressed a desire to continue to participate in town activities as a volunteer on the Parks and Recreation uh, Committee. So we look forward to her continued assistance in that way. But thank you, Mike. <coughs> Ms. Manapelli? Just uh, briefly, Jeff, I want to thank our veterans for their service and echo something that uh, Selectman Yule mentioned earlier, of, um, hoping as many people as possible can do something to commemorate the day, to com commemorate veterans, um, and uh, whatever that is, showing up for the town services or planting a plant at the grave of a veteran that you know or saying prayers for the people that are in service now or whatever that is to take some time, some special time. We, we, have, the, we have the privilege of having the day off, so doing something special for the veterans is nice. And, and uh, just, that's about it. Just thank the veterans for their service. Nothing else? Jeffrey? Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, uh, a number of things. Uh, first of all, uh, in our packet, uh, I was surprised to find out that there was a political ad uh, for the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, of which uh, mentions that uh, Hillary rejects the T TPP, everybody should, and it's a, it's a whole ad here that came in our packet, and I don't think that's appropriate information that should come across our desk, um, especially in, in light of uh, her opponent was the first one to talk about being against it. So uh, I don't think we should be receiving this kind of information in, in our packet. Uh, I find it disturbing, and uh, Hopefully, it was just put in there by accident, but uh, whoever is responsible for allowing this to be put in there, um, I, I find very, very, very disappointing. Um, I don't think that the national level should be brought down to, to the local level uh, internally into, into town government. So, uh, again, it was an ad, and it was for one side of the political spec spectrum, and I think that that is inappropriate. Um, 
with regard to uh, Veterans Day, again, I repeat, uh, you know, that's the day that we're supposed to take time and think about the veterans of all wars, the forgotten wars and the disrespected wars and the, um, that's what that day is for. It's not really for big sale days. It's not really for doing nothing. It's for recognizing veterans. And I think an hour or two for, of everybody's time would be a wonderful thing to do uh, to show our appreciation. I mean, when you think about it, it's really only two hours out of the year to show our appreciation for uh, the veterans. Uh, this year it is for the Vietnam veterans who have gone through a whole different scenario of disappointments than, than other uh, warriors for our, for our country. Um, you know, in Korea, you know, had similar uh, issues because that's the forgotten war. No one remembered that war because it followed the uh, World War II. So I think two hours out of, out of our day, come together as a community, meet at the common, and uh, we can celebrate uh, our veterans. That would be a wonderful thing to do. Uh, also, tomorrow is election day. And I guess I don't, don't need to remind anybody to vote, but I think everybody should vote and vote for whom you think is best for the country. As I said, this is the time that we all come together as a, as a nation on this one day. We all do the same thing. We get together and we decide who's going to represent us uh, uh, for the next four years. We make, a, we make some other decisions as well. Uh, there are some um, uh, four ballot questions uh, that need to be answered. I, I, it'd be inappropriate for me to suggest what people should do, but there is one question, it's question four, that I'm not afraid to say that we need to vote against question four. It is truly, truly bad for our country and everybody that lives in it because it's just simply a new roadmap, an easier roadmap to a worst case scenario of drugs. And I, I urge people <coughs> to really vote no on question four. Or the others you can debate. So uh, with that, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge our new technology. Yes. Uh, <laughs> seems to work pretty well. Yes. You seem yeah. to be working it pretty well. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting there. You're getting there. But no, you can see, you can see things now. Pretty good. So uh, it's an improvement. And again, yeah, for Sheila Sturdivant, again, uh, she's been a terrific employee and really, uh, as Michael pointed out, just uh, extremely bubbly and have a vessel. You knew, you knew she was in the room and what she was doing, a hard worker, and uh, wish her well. And uh, I'm happy to hear that she's going to be volunteering uh, with Parks and Rec. Terrific employee, and we're going to miss her, but we do wish her well. Uh, high school football team, still carrying on and doing well. So uh, yeah, we should have a lot of work, huh? I heard that. Oh, well, they a weekend miles away. Yeah, and they had another game coming up this Friday night. So uh, I wish the Hornets well. They're having a terrific season. Um, uh, just, Jeff, to your, your comment as far as what was in our correspondence, we, we can't control what's sent to the board. The staff forwards what's sent to us. And I don't always agree with the letters I get from people either, but we still accept them. You know, so it's. Uh, that was, I, don't, I don't think that we should. That just was correspondence. This. Not this is this is a little bit different. I'm sorry. It's correspondence that was sent to the board. So I don't think administrative staff should necessarily be uh, uh, deciding. You know, deciding what we get and what we don't no. get. It wasn't you know. in our meeting packet. You know, it so was correspondence. It was correspondence, right? Yeah. Not a correspondence. So anyway, you, know, well, you may agree. agree. Could, you may even agree <laughs> with it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite teacher? Oh, never mind. Uh, let's see. Uh, early voting. Uh, again, congratulations to uh, the town clerk and the staff and, uh, and to the community. I mean, we've had almost, what, almost 31 percent? 31 percent. 31 percent of our eligible voters have already cast votes and taken advantage of the opportunity for uh, early voting. 
Um, I don't know, Kate, you and I didn't draw that much uh, attention to <laughs> when we ran for office last year. Uh, nor did Bob and Mike, uh, as far as... Less than 1%. <laughs> but uh, but it, it's, it's exciting, and it's, and it's terrific. And I, you know, some people have mixed feelings about whether or not you just keep it on Election Day and you know, one day a year. But to me, providing opportunities for more people to participate is really what it's all about. And it's... Uh, we have to it, see if that's what it translates to. We don't know that yet. Well... I know. We'll see. But, uh, but again, uh, even if it's the same number of people that are voting, at least it provides more convenience for people you know, to meet their schedules. Um, but I, I went and I participated, and I know the chairman did too, and uh, it went very smoothly and very well. So uh, again, it was a challenge uh, for, for uh, the town clerk and our staff. Uh, they've met the challenge well, and uh, I've heard nothing but, but good things about it. So. Congratulations to them, and again, it'd be interesting to uh, do some Monday morning quarterbacking and see what else we can do to make it work a little bit more efficiently, and if that has to happen. So great to hear from uh, the town clerk on that uh, in a few days. Uh, yes, I really, no, and then one more thing, again, just to really urge people to get out and vote. I mean, we have, uh, you know, we elect presidents, and we elect uh, you know, senators and congressmen, and all the way down to the local level, but the... Uh, the biggest role that people need to play is to, is to be a participant and to vote. You know, be a citizen. Part of being a citizen is, is to go out there and exercise your right to vote and make these choices. And uh, whatever persuasion you may be of, you know, go out and exercise that vote. I mean, because again, as Veterans Day comes up, you know, that's what uh, these men and women, women, you know, to this date are still fighting for is our right to go out and exercise our rights to vote. And uh, you know, come this Friday, again, take some time, thank the veterans. Um, that's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Not to uh, repeat a lot of the great things that were said by fellow board members, I did want to bring up a couple things. One is I, I you know, I wanted to make sure that uh, we, and it's already been mentioned, uh, thank uh, Barbara Stats for her effort to implement the early voting uh, in an environment that wasn't optimal. No. We lack space, but she made the best of it. And I did vote early, uh, not intentionally because I could, but I wanted to check it out. <laughs> and then I had a little discussion with her. Uh, you know, it's an unfunded, unfunded mandate from the point of view of we have had to hire or pay extra people and uh, you know, jump through some hoops and so on and so forth uh, to make it happen. But uh, you know, as reported, it, successful and it's only successful because uh, Barbara put her all into making it happen. Uh, I happened to be uh, in Seattle over the weekend uh, visiting my son and interesting enough in Seattle registered voters received their ballot in the mail with an envelope to fill out the ballot and return it. They don't even go to the polls. Yikes. So. That's what's coming, maybe. I don't know. Or maybe it'll be done electronically. Uh, obviously, there's security issues and things associated with it. So the paper ballot, even if it's mailed in, you know, has a level of security that, based on what's been going on in the, te in well, the technology. Uh, Since I, my son Kevin voted in Boston. He's now a resident of Boston. I were 45 minutes in line uh, the other day. Yeah. So much for early voting. Well, well, shortening the line. Well, I didn't shorten the line. <laughs> he was complaining because they only had two people at the, at the site. But an hour and 45 minutes. But, so I, I wanted to mention one other thing, and I don't know whether I should be or shouldn't be, but the 8th uh, uh, Annual uh, Thanksgiving Dinner, sponsored by Representative uh, and Mrs. Brad Jones and Senator Bruce Tarr, is scheduled for Sunday, November 20th, 2016. Doors open at 1245 at the Hillview Country Club on 49 North Street. <laughs> I think historically the board has been invited. I don't know if you received invitations yes, yet or not. Yes, did. So. I believe the invitation came today. Right? Today, yeah. yeah. For a good turnout. And uh, that is all that I have. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second by Mr. Ewell. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.